Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Oviedo City Council meeting. If everybody can rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Where's Chief? He, uh, he is not feeling well. Well, then you're up. I could have got him off at a moment of silence and put him on the spot. No, that's okay. Brian, while you're uh, standing there, can I ask you something? Yes, sir. I got an email from a, a friend of mine, a former Marine, Bob Terry. Uh, and he has an invitation to visit the president on October 21st. Uh, which is the anniversary, the, 20, the 35th anniversary of the attack on the Beirut barracks in Beirut, Lebanon. So if you could uh, remember those uh, Marines that uh, fought and suffered that day. Okay. <clears throat> All right, if you'd like to uh, join us in prayer, please do so at this time. Father, we come to you tonight with heavy hearts. Uh, we are here to ask for your guidance and your patience. We're asking for your comfort, Lord. We're asking that you comfort all of those in Florida and Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, that were impacted by Hurricane Michael. We ask that you comfort them. We ask that you give them patience, Lord. Help them. Help them every day as they go about this hard recovery process. We reflect back when we had to deal with Hurricane Irma and the trials that we had, and we know that it is magnified much, much more than what we what we had to deal with just a year ago that we are still dealing with now. They're going to be in for a long trip, Lord, and we ask that you be with them in every step. We ask that you be with those who have served, Lord, served in the Marines in Beirut who fought valiantly in that encounter, Lord, and we ask that you be with their families as they reflect on this day. And we ask that you be with us tonight, Lord, as our council goes about the city's business. We ask that you give them wisdom. And we ask that you give them patience. And we ask that you be with all those that are in attendance tonight. And we ask that you send us home safely. In your name, amen. Thank you. All righty. At this time, I'd like to call our meeting to order. It is approximately 6.35 p.m. We have all members of council present. Our first item on our agenda, we have a couple of ceremonial items. Our first item is a 2018 Healthy Weight Community Champion Award. Dr. Correa, why don't I turn this over to you for introduction? Nope, Mr. Cobb? Who wants to handle this one? I'll take it, man. Okay. Uh, tonight, this is a request that for the council to actually receive an award uh, from the Florida Department of Health in Seminole County. Uh, we have representatives from the health department here tonight, and they would like to present the city with the health 2018 Healthy Weight Community Champion Award. Uh, this is an award that we, this is our fourth time that we've received this award. We've received this award uh, annually since 2014, and I'll turn it over to the health department folks, and they have a presentation for you, Mayor. Great. Ladies. Good evening. Greetings, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. My name is Haronda Mortimer with the Florida Department of Health in Seminole County, and I am the healthiest weight um, coordinator for the state of Florida in the Seminole County Health Department. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background to what the healthiest weight program is. We are a, um, the healthiest weight program is a public and private collaborative um, between state agencies as well as pr um, private agencies. Um, they are businesses um, as well as the entire community. Um, they're basically, we want to um, help the children and uh, adults make healthy choices about eating and active living. Um, the Healthiest Weight Florida um, employs five strategies in order to address behavior, and those strategies are to act to integrate physical activity in every day, in every way, make healthy foods available everywhere, strengthen schools as the heart of health, as well as empower employers to develop 
to provide healthy work sites. So that's a part of what you all have done, as well as market what matters um, in a healthy lifestyle. The Healthiest Weight Florida is taking a collective impact approach by working in six focus areas. And actually in the next session, it'll be seven focus areas involving um, heart health, uh, which is important for all of us. Uh, those six areas right now are schools, communities, birth, birthing facilities, early and early care and education centers, as well as healthcare settings and work sites. Ms. Venice White will give you the rest. Good evening, City of Oviedo. It is great to see many of you beyond the finish line of the Live, Work, Move Seminole 5K. So we held that event here for two years in a row. So special thanks to Drew and his team, Ben and his team, Teresa and their team, and the City of Oviedo who all showed up in one um, largest employer group for two years. So it's activities like that that the health department partners with city and jurisdictions. So we are proud to give this award to you all. Again, we will not see you next year, but we know you would win, but we will see you in two years because this designation has now moved to a two-year designation. But we will see you shortly in the fall because we'll be working with ION Improving Obito Neighborhoods to provide a resource fair. So it's things like that um, for the, that meets the goal to support local governments in implementing policies that promote healthy behaviors and environments that make it easier to have access to healthy foods such as your fabulous farmer's market and engage in physical activity, especially with your um, walks with the cop and the activities that you have with the city of Oviedo's employers. We work with your human resources to get some of their ideas as well. So great jobs, not only meeting the needs of your residents, but also of your employees of the city. So thank you. The program recognizes best practices related to complete streets policies. Your trails are wonderful. I bike here with um, Try with us, the city of Oviedo. I actually completed my first triathlon through training at the Parks and Recs pool. So your aquatic center, thank you. Um, through the county health departments and our efforts, we continue to engage in community planning with your efforts as you do with us as we host outreach and community involvement. And we also have um, our health officer, Donna Walsh, with us this evening. Keith this very brief. I can't say any more. Um, you all are just amazing. I commend you for everything you're doing, not only for your community, but for your employees, as Denise mentioned. Um, you know, your example for our county. So, so thank you so much for all that you do. We look forward to visiting you again in two years to present you with another award. I'm sure you're going to be up for it. So congratulations. We would invite you to come sure, down to do a photo op with us. That'd be wonderful. so much guys we appreciate it thank you thank you thank you yeah let's just stay down here yeah, yeah we got uh, photo club
we're just all going to stay down here because we have a second ceremonial item, which is the special recognition of the Oviedo Photo Club for its participation in the city's public arts program. Are you handling this one, Dr. Korea? All righty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So tonight, City Council is going to be considering two items from the Public Arts Board, and one of which is the Public Arts Master Plan. When we were uh, sitting down and discussing the uh, Public Arts Master Plan, we uh, uh, identified that we already had a program, a very successful program going on in the city, and that was the partnership with the Vito Photo Club. We have, uh, it's a, a permanent temporary exhibition. We have 10 photographs being exhibited here in, in, the, in the city hall and eight in our annex building. And every quarter, the Oviedo Photo Club um, renovates the, the photographs. So uh, we would like today to publicly thank the Oviedo Photo Club. Also tell the residents to come by and check uh, this beautiful exhibition. And also tell the, the community, the artistic community, the local artists in the uh, Central Florida that we are open to another, you know, other partnerships of the same style. So it's mainly to thank the Oviedo Photo Club. And if all the Oviedo Photo Club members can come on up, please. We'd greatly appreciate it. And I see we have the current president is Aaron Monroe. There you go, Aaron. I'll let you introduce everybody. Oh. Hi, I am Erin Monroe. I am the current president of the Oviedo Photo Club. And um, we are a group of hobbyists, enthusiasts, and all the way up through professionals. So if you have any interest in photography, we invite you to join us. We have two monthly meetings. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone around so other people can say their names, too. <laughs> Margie Sloan. Susan Pierce. Paula Ritchie. Oh, there you are. Mike Hurley. Rich Pulaski. Christine Touchstone. Frederick Kruger. Well, guys, we can't thank you enough. I mean, the artwork that's always here at, at the city, all the events that you show up to, all the pictures that you take for the city, every event that they come out to, you guys, they put all the photographs that they take up on their website so folks can go peruse through them, download them. As Dr. Korea said, when you look through the hallways here or over in the Annex building, it's all of their artwork and all of their great photography. So give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and Dr. Korea, I believe you have something for the president? Okay. Guys, let's get a big group photo. Nope, you're good. Get you all up front. <laughs> All right, you got it, Drew. Guys, thank you so much. We appreciate everything you do. Another round of applause for them, folks. You know, and as was mentioned, everything they do is volunteers. I mean, they don't uh, get any compensation from the city, and it is just in another exceptional thing that we have here in Oviedo. Great job, all. Now we're going to move into our actual agenda, and the first item on the agenda this evening is the approval of the minutes for our, our October 1st regular session, and I would like to entertain a motion to approve this. So moved. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Looks okay. good. Looks good. All righty. Hearing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor of the motion to approve, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, moving along, we're up to the public comment portion of our meeting. This is uh, the time that anybody in the audience who'd like to address council on any item, whether on the agenda or not, may do so. I have no written requests this evening. Uh, 
Seeing and hearing none, I will close the public comment portion and move on to our consent agenda. Our consent agenda tonight is chock full. It is items 5 through 16. Uh, what is the pleasure of council? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve 5 through 16, the full consent agenda as presented. Second. You have a motion and second. Councilman? No, sir. Looks great. Deputy Mayor? I'm good. Councilwoman? Just wanted to point out to anybody who may or may not have looked at this, there are three items on here uh, for the redevelopment of the old Albertsons Plaza. And uh, there's, about, I believe it's $13,500 that's going to be allocated to uh, public art. Uh, hopefully when, I, I hope it's not presumptuous to say when this all passes. Great. Looks Anything good. else? Oh. No, that's oh, it. Good. Looks good. Looks good. All righty. Seeing and hearing no other comments, I will call the vote. Motion on the table is to adopt the consent agenda as presented, all except for that building over there. I'm going to take that one right over. Maybe we'll take both of them off. But uh, uh, everybody who is um, motion on the table is to adopt. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great job. All righty. Who's here for consent agenda? Everybody going to clear out now? Give you a moment. See you, Dave. Only three people here on consent agenda items. Wow. All righty. Moving along, we're going to get up to item 17. Just give me a moment here to catch up. And item 17 is ordinance number 1677. So just bear with me a second, folks. And... All right. Uh, ordinance number 1677, it's amendments to our land uh, development code. This time, Mr. Group, can you read that by title only, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor. An ordinance of the City of Oviedo, Florida, amending the land development code of the City of Oviedo, specifically land development code Article 3, development agreements, orders and permits, Article 4, zoning districts and regulations, Article 5, supplementary land use regulations, Article 6, downtown mixed use districts, Article 8, parking, Article 9, signs, and Article 18, <coughs> basic definitions and interpretations. Providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for implementing administrative actions, savings, codification, correction of scrivener's errors, conflicts, and severability, and providing for an effective date. And that's the ordinance by Cobb, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Group. Mr. Cobb, can you enlighten us, please? Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is a request for Council to adopt amendments to the City's Land Development Code uh, relating to uh, special event permits, non statutory subdivisions, antiquated subdivisions. Um, residential zoning de districts, uh, boat docks, alcoholic beverages, uh, permissible uses. Uh, there are a number of things that are listed in this ordinance that are what we like to call cleanup items. There are a couple of new things in there. One of the things is incorporating uh, regulations into the code regarding microbreweries as well as microwineries. Uh, there's also some, some regulations in there for uh, pet grooming, which was some, an issue that we've had recently. Uh, there's a number of updates to the different articles. Uh, the land planning agent, local planning agency actually conducted two public hearings on this ordinance. The first was on October 2nd, 2018. They had some recommendations that were incorporated into the ordinance, and then they also had a um, second um, public hearing where they recommended adoption of the ordinance at their next meeting. I'd like to uh, call uh, Dr. Correa up to the podium. She has a presentation for you tonight to walk you through the ordinance and go over the uh, proposed uh, amendments to the LDC. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Good evening again, Dr. Correa. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. So tonight we are bringing to you, uh, to your consideration, uh, Ordinance no Number 1677. And um, if you can, um, Ordinance uh, 1677 uh, is amending uh, those articles in the LDC, Article 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 13, 14, and 18. Um, basically, we have, as Mr. Cobb said, it's a lot of cleanup items, but we have some updates. So I'll go briefly to each uh, article to um, discuss what we are proposing. In Article 3, we are proposing basically two changes. One deals with the special um, event permit section. Uh, we are proposing to exempt city activities and programs from, from uh, special event permitting. And this is really to give um, Mr. Bower, Drew, and his staff the flexibility in organizing the city events. Um, the second amendment deals with lot splits and lot aggregations and reconfigurations. 
In this action, we are proposing two changes. One is the introduction of antiquated plats, the idea of antiquated plats. Uh, the way the, the code is written right now, you cannot split uh, a plot that was platted before. It has to go through the replat process. But we identify in the city that there are old, you know, antiquated plats that for those we should waive this requirement and they could be um, just going through a, a lot split. And the definition of antiquated plats got the, the date of uh, March 1971, which was the first time that the city enacted a subdivision a regulation. We are also changing in the lot split we are making it more explicit in the code that a new lot needs to have direct access to a right-of-way, public or private. So um, we have inherited in the city landlocked parcels, and that is okay. This is, was done when the subdivision was more informal, but we should not be allowing new lots that are not uh, fronting um, directly a right-of-way. So we don't want to allow new lots that are, um, are um, accessing a right-of-way through easements. And so that is a change that we make more clear. And the frontage is a minimum of 20 feet. So these are the changes that we are proposing in, uh, in Article 3. And that also, the antiquated lots, um, uh, plants deals with uh, lot splits, lot aggregations, and lot reconfigurations. Next slide, please. Um, article uh, 4, we have a couple of updates and cleanup items. The first, uh, we changed how we present the title of the zoning districts. Before, the title was a mix of, um, we have the names of the, the zoning districts with the typology that they would allow and uh, the density, but it was not consistent. So we removed the density and the, and the uh, typology, and only we have the, now the title, we only have the names of the zoning districts, and the, the text explains the vocation of each zoning district. We also were, we have, we were missing two um, zoning districts in the definition section, which was R1B and R1BB. And they were in the table of permissible uses, but they were not in the definition, so we are including them. We are also including the use uh, of attached single family, which are townhomes in specific uh, districts, the medium density and high density um, zoning districts. We did some time ago uh, an update of Article 6 to, to allow townhomes, but we never did to Article 4. So this is the update. As to senior housing facility types, and when I say um, senior housing facility types, it's not talking about age-restricted res apartment complex. Are those uh, facility, senior facilities that require some assistance? And um, before, our classification did not match the state. So it was always hard when people would come here to exactly know in the, the license that they got from the state, how we, we would define in our code if it would be residential or commercial. So now we have um, revisited uh, all our classification to match the same um, uh, name and the same definition as the state has. So we are removing the name adult congregate living facility, which was group home, and replacing it with adult family care home, which allows no more than five disabled uh, adults living in a home. And so this is in a residential um, district. We also removed nursing homes because uh, there was no correspondence to the state uh, license anymore. And we are introducing community residential home that can be uh, commercial or residential, depending on the number of people that they, they are being served. So re residential will be up to five clients that fit the definition of the state, so it has to be one of the you know, clients of the Department of El uh, Elderly uh, Affairs and um, the Department of Justice. There is a specific definition of who is the, 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 the clients, and commercial would cover between seven and 14 people, and then we have also assisted living facility, which would be the commercial, you know, the, the large commercial facilities to provide um, uh, assistance to, to seniors. And so with these categories now, we match all the spectrum that the state covers. Um, also for animal services, uh, we really are just correcting something because our um, kennel definition included pet grooming. And the kennel, because of the nuisance that they may um, uh, um, create, is more restrictive. So we would not allow in shopping centers, for instance. And a pet grooming, which is a, really an animal service, it should be much more flexible. So we are correcting that. Um, we are also bringing to the code the discussion that we had with microbreweries, microwineries, and microdistilleries, um, and the same 
way that we had in the work session, and that is already actually a zoning progress, so now we are bringing it to the code. And it, we also expanded it to include artisan food production so that we could allow like a little um, pasta uh, place that you know has production and sales or a cheese factory, a small cheese factory in commercial um, zonings as well. And we modified both docks to clarify that roof decks are not allowed, so the second floor of, uh, of uh, of, um, the roof of a boathouse has to be pitched, cannot be flat, not to allow a second uh, floor. In Article 5, um, we also did some cleanup. We removed the reference to certificates because um, staff actually does not issue any certificates. We only sign off on the state licenses. So we have, um, we have classification in our, in our codes and uh, we removed all the reference to the state licenses because we were not covering all of them. The state has many, many licenses. So now we created a table, and that is a table that um, is provided in the ordinance page 13 that shows the type of alcoholic beverage that is allowed, the type of consumption, if it's on-site consumption or not, and if it's packaged or by the drink, and if there are any, um, uh, in which kind of establishment we are allowing, if there are any locational requirements. So it's now much more clear how we are presenting it. We also added microbreweries, micro distilleries, and micro uh, wineries to class three, so a specific class three um, that we created. And we are also proposing a little bit more of flexibility to the sale and consumption of beer and wine uh, on the premises as an accessory use to other uses. So before, it had to be only an, uh, an ancillary um, use to a restaurant and it had to be a bona fide restaurant seating 45 uh, patrons. Um, now we are giving it more flexible to uh, other uses, so um, entertainment, um, some retail, we have some salons that want to sell also and, and, and serve alcohol, so we are allowing that uh, for beer and wine. We are defining bars as um, standalone bars that sell the full range of alcoholic beverage, so food, um, wine, beer, and liquor. That is what we are calling um, uh, standalone, and th these are still prohibited in, uh, in, um, in Article 4. The only place that we allow a standalone bar is in Ovidondo Park. In Article 6, we just mirrored all the, the uh, amendments that we did to Article 4 as to senior housing, animal services, and microbrewery and artisan food production. In Article 13, parking, we added parking standards for assisted living and scrap materials uh, slash junkyards, warehouse, microbreweries, micro distilleries, and micro wineries, and adapted the parking standards to the new categories of the senior living facilities that we created. Uh, Article 14, we have the signs. Uh, we just included the clarification that uh, commemorative plaques are not considered signs, and that was a discussion we had some time ago, and that is just to, to um, a clarification. And then uh, Article 18, the basic definitions, we added new definitions. Um, so the new, new definitions are antiquated subdivisions, artisan food production, bar and cocktail lounges, boathouse, boat terminal, commemorative plaques, community residential home, microbrewery, micro winery, micro distillery, pet cat services. And then we modified the definitions for adult congregate care facility, assisted care living facility, boat dock, convenience store, an accessory structure. This one was really just to remove the word customarily because before we would say accessory structure is customarily incidental to a principal use, but that creates you know some confusion. So we removed that to say they have to be um, uh, accessory to a principal structure, and deleted the definitions of group home and nursing home. So basically, that's what. Um, uh, um, Ordinance 1677 is accomplishing. I'm here to answer any questions, and I wanted just to thank Anarch Whitfield, our planning manager. She was the one that lead the, had, took the lead in this um, amendment and, and, and took it to the how uh, to do everything. Well, that is terrific. Thank you, Dr. Creel. Let me just see if there's any questions from anyone at the council while you're there. Just going to Yes. Teresa, just, uh, I just have two things. So. Can, can only have a standalone bar in Oviedo in the park. We know about that. So, what would be an example of having alcohol being served outside of that? Would you say maybe like 
a wine store on 419 or something like that can have open sales in there? Is that what this is proposing? So we are proposing um, the, the, sal the sales ancillary to any other use, so with s some specific uses, so a salon, um, a retail store, um, the arcade most or the entertainment, right? It's an entertainment. They will have a sales of beer, but they are not a bar. Right. So they can have that, and it's just beer and wine. But actually, this is opening to just a wine room, a wine bar. Okay. Gotcha. And then the other thing I want to ask you, I know the LPA had some concerns about the parking around microbreweries. I know some members didn't think there was enough parking. Yes. How do you uh, feel about that? So we, we researched the, the, the cities that do have microbreweries, and we are comfortable with what we are proposing. So before, we, are just, we were proposing just um, a ratio on the number of seats. And during the um, conversation with the LPA, they raised that um, in, in a microbrewery environment, you can have people standing. So you could have you know, more people than, it's not the same layout as a restaurant, the sit down restaurant. And we thought that was something interesting. So we researched and Orange County had one, uh, had a standard that dealt with the seatings, with the seats and with the uh, area that uh, is available for, you know, and for micro, assembly. Microbreweries can go anywhere in the city? Microbreweries can go in the commercial areas of the city, and I can give Just you the... Commercial areas. Well, it's, it's the mid downtown mixed-use districts right. and, uh, and the C1, C2. Good. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? I just I see a lot of eyes rolling in the back of their heads. All of this stuff is contained in a larger document called the Land Development Code, correct? Yes. So you kids back there that wonder what we're talking about, there's a big book that all of this stuff is contained in. You can yeah. go look it up and read Actually, it to your heart's content. Yeah, it, the book is on, is on my, my floor over there. <laughs> yeah, that big book on the floor there. Okay. And that Good big job. book will make your eyes roll in the back of your head. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Deputy Mayor? That's good. Councilwoman, go down to you. On the boat dock issue, we had emailed a little bit about that, and in reading it again now and hearing your presentation, it may not be as unclear as I originally read it, but uh, it may be a benefit to everybody to clarify that language a little bit so uh, it is clear to everybody that you can have a boat dock in which a boat is not parked. Yeah, Councilman Slater called us, um, uh, sent an email last week, and um, asking if we would allow given the, the changes that we did, just a terminal uh, um, platform, just a, the terminal island without a boat dock associated with it. And our answer was yes, we would. But reading how we kind of tweaked the, the definition, it could be um, misconstrued that that was not the intent. So I talked already with uh, our city attorney. He already provided you know, additional language that we'll bring to you in the second uh, uh, hearing. Okay, cool. Thank so you So we very just much. changed to clarify. Our intent was to allow, so I think we would still interpret that we would allow, but I think it's better to clarify that to make it clear. All right, thank you. Anything else, Councilor? That's it for me. All right. Um, on the boat dock issue, why, why not allow the, the second story to, because a lot of times those are like the sun decks on the boat dock, and sometimes they even have a little slide that comes down. Why is that? Not. I think it, this is the history, so I was not here, but we had one case recently that they proposed it. And we read the code, and I went to, you know, did some research, and I talked to the city manager. And so the history, it seems that people did not want to allow the second back, not to allow parties, and, you know, to increase, I think, the nuisance. So the idea is to allow um, um, a boat to be um, parked there. Um, there is already, you can have the, the first platform, but they did not want to allow the second platform to have, you know. Okay. So that was the, 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 the history. Okay. And then um, one of the, uh, when, when you're talking about the antiquated subdivisions, why, I, I know you spoke to it a little bit, but why would you only choose those and not just, because basically what you're saying is that they, they're being exempt from going through the replat process. Is that what it, what it that comes down they to. could do a lot split mm -hmm. without going through a replat, yes. 
Okay. And it was just because 1971 was the, was the date that we um, uh, first enacted a subdivision regulation. So every, we considered any, anything that was done prior to that don't really follow the rules uh -huh. that we have in place, right? So we could be more um, um, flexible with those. Okay. And then um, just a couple other things. You were talking about the landlocked. So when... So what you're saying is any more, if we were to set up a plat, uh, it has to have access to a, 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 right public, away. a public right away. Yeah. So you can't, but the old ones can still use the easements and, to, to get to them. Yeah, what is there right now, we cannot change, right? right? The thing is that we cannot recreate an informal situation. So if this was accepted in 1941, we understand, but in 2018, and we are now creating those new laws, and the city is, you know, is, is, is becoming more desirable. People are want to split more land. We should have the new laws, have regular laws that face right of ways, you know, that, you know. Gotcha. All right. And then I had, I know that it's, it's been discussed a little bit here and there about the downtown use district and, and the... Um, consumption of alcohol um, throughout the throughout the park um, is that something that's that's being worked on or d discussed to to kind of carve that piece out for more of a of a of a district so that you can kind of move from restaurant to restaurant in a in a more I think my for the open container I think my understanding is that that is subject that's, to that's the state not a, that's not a land development code yeah it's not a land development that's, code that's something where we have to go to the state of Florida to yeah. get approval from them to create the district the district okay yes and uh, but it's not a it's not a zoning issue or a land regulation issue it's it's, uh, it's an alcoholic beverage issue mm -hmm. so okay. it's not something that would be Part of the land development. That we control, yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's all I have. Great. <clears throat> well, Dr. Korea, great job, as always. Thank uh, you. You are right on the docks. Uh, those of us who were here during the Live Oak Reserve debate is where the second stories were mm -hmm. uh, not allowed. And, you know, when you, when you speak to folks who have paid for lakefront property, you know, their fear is, you know, their view is going to be blocked. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not, not so much even turning it into a party deck. It's just that you'd have this massive structure, and uh, not everybody has the same amount of lakefront, so how do you regulate it? Mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, it could be fair to say you have 150 foot of lakefront, you know, I have plenty of room, why not? But what about the person that has 20 foot of lakefront? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm glad to see that we're kind of still sticking with that. Um, you know, the microbreweries and all of that, it's, you know, great to see us finally cleaning the code up. Uh, most folks don't realize, and uh, you know, a lot of folks in the audience today, I know as um, Deputy Mayor pointed out, I mean, a lot of this just is technical numbers and stuff to all of you, but we had a lot of um, politely put antiquated codes, some from the 70s, mm -hmm. in our land development code that just weren't well defined on a lot of issues. So it left everything open to interpretation, to uh, could it be done? Could it not be done? How do we make it happen as, to put, as opposed to there just being a clear-cut code on how to do it? Uh, microbreweries and parking, I'm not as concerned about that. Uh, you know, microbreweries tend to attract a different crowd. You know, it's not the type of place that, you know, 100 people show up to. Uh, a lot of folks will bike, walk, Uber when they're going out to a, a microbrewery or even a, a larger brewery. So, um, and, and a lot of them nowadays are located in older sections of town with no parking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can go to any one of the ones in Orlando, go to 1010, for instance, and there's eight parking spots, and, you know, you just kind of fend for yourself. Uh, so that's uh, good that we're just cleaning all of this up, you know, and, and not having it open to interpretation, not having to do developer agreements. It's uh, uh, a long time coming, and uh, I realize how much work this took to get us here with these, and then we'll just keep working forward as you you and your staff identify these things, because you're the one who deals with it all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just bring them to us and let's just clean them up as we go, you yep. know, and fit into the world of 2020 and forward, you know, as opposed to 1971 when it was much different. 
So great job. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Korea? Thank you, Teresa. No? Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. All righty. Well, before I, I schedule the second uh, public hearing, this is a public hearing, so does anybody want to address us on anything you heard tonight? I have no written request. Seeing and hearing none, I am going to close the public hearing. Pardon? No? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing, and I'm going to entertain a motion to schedule a second public hearing on November 5th, 2018, here at Oviedo City Hall in the Oviedo City Council Chambers, 400 Alexandria Boulevard, Oviedo, Florida, 32765 at approximately 6.30 p.m. So moved. Oh. Second. We have motion second. Any further discussion, guys? Good. We good? Good. All right. Hearing and seeing none, uh, all in favor of scheduling the public hearing for November 5, 30 p.m. here at Oviedo, Oviedo City Hall, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. All right. Let's move along. We are up to item number 18. This is resolution number 3632-18. It's approval of the certificate of vesting for the Seminole County Housing Authority. Uh, Mr. Cobb, can you enlighten us, please? Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is a request for Council to approve a certificate of vesting uh, for the Seminole County Housing Authority related to a permissible use within the medium density residential future land use designation, as well as the uh, R2 residential zoning district. Uh, the property owner has uh, operated a affordable multifamily housing development. Uh, on the property since the 50s, uh, well before the city had land zoning regulations and land development regulations. Uh, they are currently undergoing a process to upgrade the housing authority properties in the city. And so the best course of action that we could come up with to address the issue that they have, is with, which is with their zoning classification, their zoning classification doesn't necessarily allow them on their property even though they were there before the zoning was was adopted and so uh, what we've recommended is that uh, working with Mr. Groove we've recommended that they bring forward a certificate of vesting there are certain justifications that they had to provide and that was reviewed by staff uh, the certificate of vesting will vest the use of the property for an affordable multifamily residential use uh, not to exceed 60 dwelling units uh, which will not exceed the maximum density of eight dwelling units per acre for the uh, medium density residential future land use designation. And so tonight um, it is recommended that the City Council adopt resolution number 3632-18 after you conduct your public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Is there a representative here from the Housing Authority who would like to address City Council at this time? Good evening. Just name and address for the record and who you are and then the floor is yours. Yes. My name is LaShonda Levitt. I am the Deputy Director of the Seminole County Housing Authority. Um, he, he, Mr. Bryan basically gave the presentation for me. Um, we were established in the 50s. We had now have 30 public housing units that was um, built in the 60s. And we're finally to the point where we have a lot of capital needs from roofs to ACs. Uh, we need new electricity put into it needs to be retrofitted, basically. We've done all that we can do um, to bring them up to code and to make them better, but we only have so much money coming from HUD. And public housing is the one program that HUD has continuously defunded over time. They've made it very clear that they no longer want to be in the business of providing public housing. So as a housing authority, we have to go out into the community and find those dollars to bring housing in. So that is why we're here asking for your assistance. Um, I brought somebody from my team. Her name is Erin. Um, and I would like for her to come up and give you more details about our redevelopment efforts. Oh, thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, my name is Erin Schlitz. Um, I'm uh, with Smith & Henze. We're the co-developer of uh, the Seminole County Housing Authority. And um, I think most of what I was going to say has been covered. But um, the essence of what we're trying to do is um, demolish the existing 30 units um, and rebuild 60 new units of affordable housing on um, the three parcels that the Housing Authority currently owns. 
Um, so you're doing a whole new site plan then? Uh, correct. Oh, okay. And so, the, so at this point, we are um, we are asking for the use, the multifamily use, to be vested, um, and then you know the site plan is still pending, lots of review and approval. So we're here any, to answer any questions. Any questions for the applicant while she's here? Quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, where are the, the current residents going to go when you rebuild? What's the plan for them? Um, so we will have a relocation plan. Um, and in our development budget, we will allocate funds to uh, relocate them temporarily while we're constructing the new buildings. Well, they, the, the people out of there will come back into the new units. They will have the opportunity and to come back. And you'll have the, the other extra units. How, what's the time frame if everything goes, your wish list is granted? Yeah, it's a little, it's a little tough to predict. Um, we are uh, currently uh, preparing applications to be submitted to um, Florida Housing Finance Corporation, the state agency for um, low-income housing tax credits. Um, so those applications will be due over the next few months. Um, and, you know, if everything goes really well, we receive the tax credits, we could be looking at, um, I would say the earliest would be probably mm, next summer, late next year of, of um, going into credit underwriting and then we close the financing and begin construction. Good luck. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I guess, uh, are you going to use any of the, I guess they call them Sandusky funds? Are you going to try to apply for those? Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with those. That's the affordable housing fund the state has, and I understand there's quite a bit of uh, funding coming forward if the legislature makes it available. You might want to look into that. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. In Good opportunity. Anybody else? Back to Councilman Hankins' uh, question. The, when you relocate them, are you going to be able to relocate them within the within the city so that they're, especially if they have children that that are in our school systems, that they'll be able to continue to to stay in their same schools and stuff? Yeah, that's absolutely our intent. Okay. Yeah. And is it going to be phased, or is it you're cleaning cleaning the whole site and then starting over? Those details are to be worked out still. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So what HUD, HUD gives us what's called tenant protection vouchers, where we, the, the family would be able to stay in Seminole County um, and stay in the area that they're currently in. So HUD actually will give us a voucher for that family for them to be able to move out during the um, rebuilding phase. Then once it's over, they have the first right to come back if they want to. So HUD actually gives us the funding to be able to move the families, and we will help them you know, from start to finish, so we will be taking them out into into the community to help them find a new unit, helping them with deposits. So, again, HUD gives us a lot of money up front to help families move and stay whole during that process. Right. So, are you going to do a phased approach to it? Or are you um, honestly, it's thirty. Mm -hmm. And we're very familiar with the family, so we feel like we're going to be able to move them all at once. And I say we feel that way. Once we get started, if we feel the need to kind of dial it back, then we'll do that. Okay. It's probably easier to just do it all at once. So yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I would just add that from a construction efficiency perspective and keeping costs down, it would be beneficial if we could, you know, of course, build all at once. Um, 60 units is, um, you know, not not a huge number of units to build in a single phase. Councilwoman, anything? I'm assuming you guys have talked with the school board about this. Uh, my, my kids go to Jackson Heights, so they, they know people who live in this area, uh, and that is hard on a kid to have to move. So when people are relocated, um, you know, according to UCF's economist guy that goes around and talks about these things, we are 10,000 housing units short in this area. Uh, so to say we're just going to relocate, I mean, it, and this really isn't our gig up here. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for the, the vesting certificate, but I think a lot of people in the audience uh, are probably interested to know how, how are we going to keep these people part of our community during the construction? Because you know, that, that could be 18 months away mm -hmm. uh, from, your, from your home base before you can come back. Uh, is, is there a, a discussion with a school board for potentially keeping students at their home base school? It has not, but since you bring that up, we will definitely reach out to them 
And I would say because you bring up that point when we're planning out the relocation of the families that we can keep when kids go to school in mind when we're planning that out. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. We appreciate answering all of our questions, and uh, we'll see where this goes. And best of luck with your project. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you. All righty, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to address City Council on resolution number 3632-18? Seeing and hearing none, we will close the public comments and move on to the pleasure of council. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Hank. I'd like to make a motion to adopt 3632-18. Second that. A motion second. Any further discussion? No, sir. No? That's good. Anybody? Good. Looking good. All righty. Uh, the motion on the table is to adopt resolution 3632-18. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. There you go, guys. Go forth and build. You have enough issues. You don't need us getting in the way. <laughs> All righty. First reading of ordinances, we have none. So we're moving on to our resolutions first one up is resolution number 3636-18 that is the public art master plan mr cobb can you enlighten everybody and then i think there's a presentation so i'll just let you take it over from you. thank you mayor uh, this is a request for city council to adopt our public arts master plan on october august 7 2017 council adopted ordinance number 1653 and this ordinance did two things it set forth the city's public arts policy and it also established the public arts board now one of the responsibilities of the public arts board was to prepare the public arts plan that is proposed before you tonight to establish goals objectives and strategies relating to public works of art for display in the city uh, the staff has reviewed the plan and recommends approval. The city attorney has also reviewed the plan, found no legal, op uh, no legal objections. I'd like to introduce Ms. Jennifer Webb from the Public Arts Board, and she has a presentation for you. And it's recommended that the council adopt resolution number 3636-18. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Hi, Jennifer, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Again, my name is Jennifer Webb, and on behalf of the Public Arts Committee, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight on the proposed Public Arts Master Plan. Uh, these are the points that we will be covering during the presentation, which follows the format of the Master Plan itself. We're going to discuss a little bit about um, some of the definitions of public art and the, some of the functionalities and the um, some of the details in the master plan that discuss how we can incorporate public art within our community. Next slide. As um, Mr. Cobb had mo mentioned, the city began to embrace the idea of incorporating public art over two years ago with the development of the Oviedo Public Arts Policy Ordinance and unanimously approved by the City Council on July 17, 2017. And this, as a result, has created the master plan we are presenting today. And we want to outline the benefits of public arts within the community and identify different opportunities to incorporate public arts within the city into the future. <coughs> public art has come in a wide variety of forms which will greatly enhance the city. We have many opportunities within the city to bring public art into some of our most common spaces. These various ways of defining public art are ideas and examples that the master plan identifies. Public art can act as a narrative of the city by incorporating Oviedo's history and character. Throughout Oviedo's long and rich history, we have much to draw from that can tell about the story of Oviedo, its past, the character of the city, and the direction that it can take into the future. These are all buildings that have um, been in Oviedo and many of them no longer exist. Public art and all its diversity can mediate all spaces as places. The ordinance allows the city to utilize all the public space we have to offer. As discussed earlier today, we are using the interior of City Hall with the Oviedo Photo Club and hope that there are many other opportunities that we can present public art within the public spaces of the city. For example, um, the areas around City Hall are places in which public art installations can create opportunities for the community to get together and experience art at the same time. 
These spaces are optimal temporary installations. For example, a pop-up park in the empty space next to City Hall can allow innovative, creative, and fun uses for currently open spaces. Public art can be a role of placemaking and economic development that enhance our, our city. Art installations are destinations in themselves, creating the opportunities and improve the quality of life with the retention and attraction of talent and increase in the economic role of design and creativity. He, these are examples of famous art installations throughout the world. Chicken. Including the chicken, yes. <laughs> um, next one, please. Placing art in private and semi-public spaces, such as murals, benches, bike racks, and transformers can help take the ordinary and turn it into something unique. One of the most well-known local examples is the Art Box Project in Mills 50 neighborhood in Orlando. By collaborating with local businesses, utilities, organizations, and community leaders, the Mills 50 neighborhood organization was able to have every utility box in their neighborhood become a blank canvas for an art project. This project brought a lot of awareness to the community and other Orlando neighborhood groups are undertaking similar projects. The ordinance creates a public arts fund which appropriates funds for the purpose of public art. That was kind of, Funds for the art projects may be obtained or solicited from other public sector agencies private foundations, granting bodies, businesses, organizations, or individuals. And as noted in the ordinance, these are the five different avenues to obtain art funding. For a piece of public art to be adopted by the Public Art Board, there's a simple process for approval. Public Works of Art application form is submitted for review. Then the ordinance in the master plan identifies the requirements specific for the application. After a piece of art has been selected and recommended by the board, it is then approved by the city council, after which the artist will receive a notice of acceptance. After the notice of acceptance, the city will coordinate installation with the artist directly. The time frame varies depending upon the art that will be installed and the process in which it moves forward. In fact, we will have, after this presentation, we will have an example of our very first uh, public installation that we would like to present to you as well. And there are many spaces within Oviedo that could benefit from having public art. As noted earlier, public art becomes a placemaker, which can be an economic and cultural driver within the community. Some of the more visible locations where art can be placed is by the development of a cultural corridor along Oviedo Boulevard, which connects the central part of the city. However, art can be placed anywhere within the city limits. These locations noted here are among the most frequently traveled places within the city and can be prime locations for future art installations. However, we, again, we want to stress that these are not the only locations where art can occur. A major tenet of public art is that art is made available for all people to see and experience. And for those who have a visual or mobile impairment, traditional forms of public art is not truly accessible. The city and its plan for public arts hopes to create and foster public art that is available for everyone, regardless of status or ability. Additionally, creativity is just as important in education as literacy. Art education programs are an excellent way to educate and stimulate conversation on public art that could be extended into our schools and in other education formats that we can collaborate with. It is the responsibility of the City of Oviedo to maintain, restore, and reserve all art owned by the city. Each art installation will include a maintenance plan that identifies how to maintain and conserve each piece to ensure that each public art item will remain in good condition for years to come. And Steve Jobs said that creativity is just connecting things. The broader one's understanding of human experience, the better design we will have. And so we're hoping to create new experiences in the city of Oviedo through art. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and we're open for any questions or comments you might have. Jennifer, if you don't mind, I know there's many members of your board here. Can all the members stand and maybe just sure. introduce them? Yeah. Okay. If you guys want to introduce yourselves. Come on up. Come on, yeah. Mary, you're yeah, first. Come on. <laughs> I'm Mary Blake. I'm on your board. Uh, 
on your arts board, but I'm also a representative of Seminole Cultural Arts Committee. Terrific. All right. Come on up, guys. You can all come up at once. You don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> we don't bite. I'm Genevieve Fruit. I'm on the Public Arts Board. I just hand the mic back and forth. It'll be easier. There you go. Lisa Ramsey. Melissa Cilio. Hi, I'm Karen Dom. Hi, Karen. How are you? Margie Sloan. Frederick Kruger. Well, give them all a big round of applause. And we do appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Jennifer at this time? No? no. All right. Okay. Dr. Korea, I have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind. Uh, I know we have different funding sources that we've been working on, uh, and there's a certain percentage of one of our budgets, Parks and Rec, I think it is, that goes into it. How does, how does that work? Just in so it's 1% of capital improvement projects that, and it's not including infrastructure or, you know, but um, <clears throat> any new project that the city, any new facility that the city builds or uh, any major renovation, 1% of that should be um, donated or uh, And that would come from public funds, from our funds. From public uh, funds. funds, yes. Now, also, very uniquely, the developers are able to donate to this fund for mitigation credits. For and, mitigation, and now, yeah. Now, I know there's been two or three of them that have been done already. Can you enlighten us on the dollar amount that's been donated already? So the first project donated $10,000. And today, you approved three projects that will have a, a combined um, uh, sum of $13,500. So now we have $23,500 in the uh, Public Arts Fund. And then uh, the city hasn't made a donation yet from capital improvement projects. If whenever we build a, you know, a new facility, then 1%, <coughs> and it's, it's maxed out to 50%, oh, sorry, $50,000. That's the cap. So we should build the police station pretty quickly. The police station, saying. yes. So we are looking forward to the police station. I'm sure you are. <laughs> Brian, just write him a check for 50000 because that's probably six million. Yeah. We're looking at a very nice work of art out front. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, they can, that's the other thing. They can also use that money to, to put public art in their own uh, facility. That would also meet the intent. And we also, the CRA has also $25,000, you know, funded for us. So that's also... Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Right, so that gives you almost 50000 Yeah, that's a good start. That's, that's a very good start. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any questions for Dr. Korea? All right. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All righty. Well, I have no request to speak forms on this item. Does anybody like to address City Council on Resolution 3636-18? Seeing and hearing none, uh, we will move on to the pleasure of council. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to adopt Resolution 3636-18. Second. Motion and a second. Councilman Hankin, anything else to add? Uh, just, just quickly, I just want to thank all the members of the board. I remember when we appointed it, it was in its concept, and we were looking at the applications, and, you know, sometimes serving on a board is a thankless job. You put in a lot of hours, and not that many people realize it, but when the work starts going out there, it's what's going to make Oviedo even more special, to see these these art exhibits and, and things that are around. And I know some of you pretty well, and you have good life experiences that you'll bring bring some good stuff there and I, I don't think there's going to be too many things you'll bring us that we're not going to approve. You know, like if you guys are approving it, I know you'll vet it out good and it'll be looking good. So I just want to thank all of you for, for your time and on that and look forward to seeing these projects. And yeah, uh, Brian, they're going to need that check, give them some money to play with. So thank, thank you all. 50, 50K is not a bad start. Uh, who is my second? I just want to thank you all as well and also um, I can't wait to, to see what you all have in store for us with uh, once it starts getting out there and the color and the, the art. I think it's going to be really exciting and it'll, it'll be fun to drive around the, the, the town and see the new, new forms of art. Great. Councilwoman, anything dead? 
we got off to a really slow start with this, right, guys? Uh, thank you for serving and continuing to go. And, and now, now you've got funding, so there's something to do. Um, as we get moving on this, um, the, the order of operations involves council being the end of the line for determining if it's a thumbs up or thumbs down for content. And uh, I think everybody up here knows I'm a fan of decentralized decision making. So over time, I hope there will be a movement to maybe consider uh, perhaps letting it end with our board and having this body not really make the final call on, on what is art that's approved. So that's, yeah, it sounds great for now, but over time, maybe need to let them just roll. See what happens. Deputy Mayor? I'm good. Good luck to you guys. Yeah. Great job by all. Uh, motion on the table is to adopt the resolution 3636-18. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving along to the last item on our agenda this evening. <coughs> This is resolution 3637-18. It's a call to artists to design and paint the mural at Round Lake Park. Mr. Cobb, can you enlighten us? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Before I begin, I want to let you know that on the dais tonight is a document. It's called Exhibit 1. Uh, this is Exhibit 1 of this resolution. Unfortunately, uh, it did not get uploaded to your iPads, and so we wanted to make sure you had it before you tonight. Um, it, it describes the call to artists uh, program that's being proposed, and so we wanted to make sure that you had that so that when you, uh, if you do decide to adopt the resolution, that it will be adopting this exhibit one as well. Uh, one of the recommended programs of the Public Art Master Plan is to, uh, as a mural program, and uh, the Public Arts Board has. Um, uh, reviewed this idea and uh, they proposed a call to artists uh, to request proposals from artists and graphic designers to paint a mural at Round Lake Park uh, uh, to celebrate Black History Month in the city of Oviedo. Uh, Round Lake Park is located in a uh, largely African American neighborhood and rich in history and tradition and so they're wanting to uh, have a call to artists to prepare a mural to be located on the uh, racquetball courts. Uh, the top three proposals uh, will be presented to the City Council for final approval. Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Fruitt to come back up and give you uh, some detail about the program. And once she's done, Merritt's recommended that um, City Council adopt resolution number 3637-18. Thank you. Yeah. Whomever would like to do it. Good, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and City Council members. You do know we miss having you around City Hall. Yeah. So I'm private, here. Private, private sector isn't all it's cut up to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here representing the uh, Public Arts Board, and we are very proud to bring to you this first call to artists to um, for a mural to be located in a public space in the city of Oviedo, which is going to be um, Round Lake Park. And this first mural will celebrate the black history in the city of Oviedo. And um, the artists will have from October 18 until December 7 to submit proposals. And the Public Arts Board will rank the proposals and bring for city council the first three ones for your consideration and approval. Um, the criteria will be basically art artistic excellence, creativity, resume, and portfolio, and adherence to the entry requirements. So um, the Oviedo Citizen in Action will be celebrating 50 years uh, of activities here in the city, and we are trying to unveil the um, um, winning design, if possible, at the Martin Luther King Day, which is a, a celebration that is usually organized by the city and the uh, Oviedo Citizen in, in Action. And this is going to be the first initiative of the Public Arts Board, and we are very excited with that. And um, we, we hope that this is going to be the first of many of 
uh, initiatives. So I'd like to, if City Council um, agrees to invite one representative of the Ovido Citizens in, in action, we have people here. Yes? Would you mind coming here? So they could talk about the celebration, the 50 years, and how they um, are participating also in this initiative. Thank you. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I told Ben I wasn't going to speak, but yes, we are getting ready to celebrate our, our 50th anniversary, which will be held uh, next April. It's actually uh, 2019. Uh, so you'll be receiving invitations and notices on that at a later time. Uh, our president is currently out of the country right now uh, on a uh, church retreat, so she should be entering back, but she wasn't going to be able to make it here. I have been our vice president of Oviedo Citizen Action here as well. We look forward to it. There are some changes uh, that are coming up for the 2019 Dr. King celebration in the park. Uh, there's some things going on with uh, renovation over at the park, which Drew could uh, address if, if need be. But we are uh, making other plans when we like to really see this project go forward. Uh, we also like to thank the city if approved, uh, for allowing uh, Oviedo Citizen Action to be uh, working closely with the our council on creating this this event so uh we thank you uh and um, we hope we can get approval from the council tonight great thank you danny thank you now ben since you sent danny up why don't you come on up and say something <laughs> <laughs> i'm not letting you get off that easy mr vice president he just ruined his day. That's all yes, right. Uh, we got to get Ben out of his, you know. Benjamin Williams, uh, Vice President of OCIA. Uh, for my sanity, I would like to uh, correct something that happened earlier. Uh, Dr. Correa had, uh, had, uh, was the spearhead for the uh, healthiest communities, not myself. And uh, she, <laughs> so I don't have to pay for that for two more years. Yeah, so the health department was a con little confused. But I, I took the picture anyway, so we wouldn't confuse Drew. <laughs> so, uh, but we had, ben, ben, that's too easy. Come on. <laughs> uh, Kathy, who was the, the president of OCI, and myself, vice president, had the opportunity of sitting with the Public Art Board to uh, uh, be involved in the initial process. And it's an amazing board uh, with uh, enthusiastic and competent people. And so we're, we're confident something nice will come out of this and uh, remember it for a long time so thank you excellent thank you Ben all right so let's see now public comments anybody have anything anybody like that no all right you're gonna close the public comment and move on to the pleasure of council mr. mayor yes I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution 3637-18 second motion second any further discussion just can't wait to see that mural. It's going to be good. Yeah. Deputy Mayor, anything? I'm good, but Ben is way too modest. Ben does a lot of work uh, for a lot of uh, folks in this city. He does. Off to my right, anybody? My daughter bikes through that park every day on the way to school and back again, so I'm really looking forward to uh, her reaction to it when it's up. Anything, Bob? Can't wait to see it. Great. All righty, guys. Well, uh, this will be the first one, so make it a great one, and we'll have a big celebration out there when it's all complete. It looks like you put about a four-month timeline on it, so uh, let's get it done. All righty, so the motion on the table is to adopt. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. There we go. Great job, everybody. Thank you. All righty, so moving along. Yes, please, we'll take a break for a second. You can all clear up. The kids over there probably want to go home. How old are these young ladies? Oh my goodness, so elementary school I'm assuming. Thank you everyone. Have a great night. Bye Karen.
Let's see, we have no discussion items. And before I go on to the city manager's report, I should have mentioned this while everybody was here. They might be able to still hear us out in the audience. Uh, for those of you who did not know, we have a birthday celebration here this evening. <laughs> Chief Coleman, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Chief. Happy birthday. I was at a luncheon with him today, and he was surprised with a dessert with a candle. So, uh, All right. And, and the whole restaurant sang him happy birthday. I don't know if he liked it or not. But, uh, <laughs> well, I think, I think we were going to get him some candles tonight, but because Lars was out, we weren't able to yeah, get that permit. Yeah. <laughs> they want to stress that sprinkler system. <laughs> oh. Happy birthday, Chief. All righty. So moving along, we are up to city manager's report. Mr. Cop, you're up. I have no report, man. Mr. Groot. Nothing to see, Mr. Mayor. All righty. Uh, Councilman Hankin, you're first. I'll keep it going. I'm good. Councilwoman. I had a great time at the Oviedo Police Foundation's bowling tournament, so that was really fun. And I didn't really talk to anybody but my family. So if you're looking for something fun to do that's actually about, you know, hanging with people you came with, that's a great thing to go to. Um, I also wanted to follow up. Linda Smart lives right outside city limits, right up against a Taylor Morrison development. And I've mentioned to the staff a couple of times and uh, reached out to the developer as well. And there is a lot of water that is getting redirected to her property. And everybody seems to agree, the developer and, and the county, uh, and, and you know, it's right where's at our that, border. That? This is the Taylor Morrison development right down Lake Charm Drive. Oh. Uh, so she's technically outside of city limits, but we've got a bond on that project. I uh, just want to make sure that everybody here stays vigilant to make sure that, that her issue is addressed because everybody agrees that, that the water didn't used to flow, you know, used to flow one way and now it flows a different way. And, it, and it's making it so she can't use her driveway to you know, where, where the driveway was to get to her home. So just hoping maybe there could be a little bit of follow-up. Uh, it sounds like she has been pulling, trying on her own to get the county and, and the developer to correct the issue, and it's, it's just not happening. So whatever we can do from our end, uh, hopefully we can let her just be in peace where she's lived for, it's over 30 years. And that's it for me. Good. All righty. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you're up. Um, two quick things. One is... Uh, Talking about the uh, housing authority, it just came to my mind, uh, maybe we can reach out to them and encourage them to put uh, renewable energy in their plan and try to get some solar panels up so we can start on that track of uh, becoming sustainable. And the other one is just a kind of a sentimental thing. We were up here probably 10 years ago and there were two young kids uh, came up here, they were in the, like the fifth or sixth grade. Stand up, Matt. And this was one of them. Come on up, Matt. Uh -oh. He came up to us with his buddy and uh, asked us if we could do something to let them ride their, their bikes on oh, the, the skateboard park. Yes, sir. Was that 10 years ago? No, it's that's... been a while. Oh, my goodness. I <laughs> 10 that. years ago, I'd be 12. That sounds about right. Oh, my goodness. This is what happens when you get uh, kids involved in civic affairs and they come back and see us. So yeah, absolutely. That was absolutely. to ride the scooters or the bicycles, right? Yes, the bicycles. The bike. Yeah, because scooters was like two yeah. years ago. Yeah, was <laughs> really, that's a new one. So i got to help them out now. Some more middle schoolers came and asked about scooters. <laughs> awesome. Good to hear. Yeah. It's good to hear. Uh, well, good. Such a trend. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you studying? Uh, right now I'm just studying, um, just really I'm just trying to get my A, just general uh, general studies. Um, after that I'm going for biochemistry, trying to get my PhD in that. All right. Good, good job. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Future that's all I got. Future leaders right yep. there. That's right. He changed the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did. That was a big deal. All those kids love that. See, Drew, you fought that all those years. <laughs> yeah, that, this young man had to come in here and get us to uh, fix that. All right. Great job. Nice to see you. Uh, let's see. I'm up. I really have no report tonight. We'll make it easy. Councilmember Pollock. I've got a long list. I'm no, sure I'm you do. I'm just kidding. I'm good. You're good? Yes. All righty. Future meeting dates. We have uh, Monday, November 5th, 6.30 p.m. Monday, uh, November 19th, there is no meeting. That meeting is canceled. We have Monday, December 3rd. We have a 5.30 p.m. CRA meeting and a, a 6.30 p.m. regular session. That will be our only meeting in December. 
Then we go on to, believe it or not, 2019, January 7th, 6.30 p.m., January 22nd, uh, 6.30 p.m., which is actually a Tuesday. Always messes everybody up in January. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Mr. Cobb, Mr. Groot, Department Directors, Chief, happy birthday, and we are adjourned.